So we, um, we spent some time talking about oral argument and how it affects uh, or can affect the way in which you think about a case. So Justice Powell, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you prepare for oral argument. Do you come in with a list of questions that you hope to ask? Do you sort of see how the conversation goes? Do you have uh, particular questions or issues that you want to try to see get resolved whether you're asking the question or, or one of your colleagues is? How, how do you start to think about oral argument when that day arrives? Generally, I will come into oral argument with some questions that I want answered. I'll have them written down in my book and scripted out so that I can ask them intelligently before the cameras. And half the time I don't get to them or the flow of the argument will turn me in an entirely different uh, direction. And so it, it, a lot depends on how the argument is going, what questions my colleagues may be asking, something that they may say that I hadn't focused on in the brief from the litigants. And so I will come in with questions. I don't always get them answered or they may become irrelevant depending on how the conversation is flowing. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of questions are you typically looking for at that point or trying to get answered? The answer to the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer to the case. <laughs> but, who wins, who loses. But is it, are there questions that the briefs didn't answer sufficiently? Are there qu typically questions that you think they They're didn't address? They're generally questions that the brief raises. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have an answer, but my question might be a what if. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question might be, the appellee argues X and you've argued Y, and I don't see that either answer is sufficient for mm -hmm. my purposes. And mm -hmm. so I may ask both litigants to answer the same question, mm -hmm. but they're generally questions that is slightly different from the argument that was made. Testing the, the boundaries of the argument, yes. for example. You can think about the implications of, of what that argument might be. Um, Justice Mims, let me ask you, uh, about oral argument, what do you see as the, the purpose of oral argument? Every member of the court comes into oral argument with the desire to sharpen their thought process. So to some extent, oral argument allows us to do that. But it actually it goes beyond that. Uh, and this, uh, this um, is something that, that Justice Powell just touched upon. The litigants are there for one reason. They want to win their case. And they, they argue uh, very effectively. Um, we have multiple reasons. We want to decide their case fairly. And we are trying very hard to do so. <coughs> but we also have to remember that the opinion that is written by one of the members of the court and then is agreed to by a majority of the court <coughs> is going to be used in an innumerable number of cases in the future all throughout the Commonwealth. And so we have to make sure that the law <coughs> that we are being asked to, to um, address, <coughs> the issue we're being asked to address, can't be looked at only through the lens of those two advocates. So we will frequently use oral argument for purposes of asking hypothetical questions. I'll take their fact pattern and I'll change one fact and I'll ask both of the, um, both of the lawyers to address it with that one fact changed. Because I'm thinking not in terms only of what are we going to do one month from now. I'm thinking in terms of what is a trial, gonna, trial judge going to do 10 years from now. Have you ever been surprised by what a trial judge has done with an opinion 10 years from now? I think we have each, at one time or another, been surprised at what trial judges have done with our opinions. And I think that it goes the opposite way, too. I think trial judges, at times, are surprised with what we do with uh, their <laughs> cases. That's the, that's the nature of, uh, of human nature. Um, we are, um, none of us are, um, uh, are perfect. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we all try to do the best we can. So confession time, uh, we've been talking about oral argument. Who has used a question at oral argument to actually talk to one of your colleagues as opposed to? Uh, who, <laughs> who hasn't? Oh, okay. yeah. All right, so Chief Judge Justice, can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Um, if I'm unhappy with the way the tone of the questioning is going, I am not against and have done frequently interject a question to try to 
get the attention of my colleagues. Um, I had to change the tone of the conversation yes, a little bit. Or to, or to realize that, that perhaps the questioning is going in a direction that I don't agree with, mm -hmm. and the unfortunately the attorney is not able to turn it around. And so, you know, I want to get the whole issue on the table. I want my colleagues to think about this in a different way. They may not change their mind, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure it's fully developed. And Justice Goodwin, you said you've, you've done that too. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and for exactly the same reason. Mm -hmm. Or um, sometimes you want to nail something down, especially if you know a colleague's like, well, I'm not sure about X or Y. It's like, you are saying X, right? <laughs> You know, you want to make sure that the person articulates it in a way that your colleagues will understand it. So sometimes you might ask them a question to give them the opportunity to do that. And of course, that could cut either way. Because I think sometimes you feel like people misunderstand what somebody's saying, and because of that, they would support their position. When in actuality, if you really understand what this person's saying, you would never support that position. And uh, if I have the opportunity and a question to to bring that out, especially if I'm hearing questions from my colleagues that are kind of frightening me a little bit about where they're going with the case, yeah, you're going you're to ask the question. And, and quite honestly, through that question, it kind of signals to them your thought process as you go into to this opinion conference. Just sort of rephrase, thing. reframe a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. Reframe the issue. Mm -hmm. Just what? You had a view on I that? I actually do that, too. Um, I know that there are times when I may think that I've got a couple of votes from the way the questions are being asked. Uh, and I want to try to get nailed down my fourth vote so I've got a majority. And I want to make sure that the uh, person who's arguing has a chance to, to really explain what I think they may have said in the brief and they may have not brought it out as clearly as I'd like them to, to have brought it out to the rest of the court. So it's actually almost um, a preview of the argument we're, got, we're going to make later on at the opinion conference to, to get that kind of question out there. Do you think counsel recognize that's what you're doing? I hope so. And I can tell you sometimes they don't because sometimes the rest of us will sit there and say, Counselor, that was a um, uh, softball question. <laughs> it really was not a hardball question. And so sometimes they don't understand it, but I think a lot of times they do. So what sort of advice then would you give to attorneys at argument along those lines? Listen, listen, listen. Mm -hmm. um, I think too often attorneys come into oral argument with a preconceived um, notion of what they want to tell us. And unfortunately, sometimes it's just a, a restatement of what they've already put in their written briefs. That's not what we're looking for. I think the most important asset that a um, litigant can have, an oral argument before us, is to listen closely to what the questions are and to see where we're trying to go and answer the question. And then, of course, get back to your own argument if, if you fully answer our questions. But um, I don't think you can listen too closely. Just, yeah, there, just there are two things that every appellate lawyer ought to remember when they're standing at the podium. And one is they need to think like a judge because they need to, to respond to us and our questions in a manner that is relating to an opinion, and more importantly, a majority opinion, as Justice Millett was, was talking about. As a result, um, they need to understand that this is their only opportunity to sit at our table. And if you're going to participate in the development of this opinion, this is your only opportunity to sit at the table you better listen carefully to the other diners. And that's why this opinion, the, the questioning process is so important. I remember once on the Court of Appeals, um, this dynamic of uh, the judges asking questions that really weren't to the lawyer, they were to the other judge at the other end of the, of the bench, got so acute that this lawyer said at one point, if it'll help, I'll just sit down and let you all work this out. Now, I don't suggest doing that in the Court of Appeals or in our court, but having said it, w what this lawyer was demonstrating is the lawyer really knew what was going on. And the, this lawyer knew that um, some of the questions that were being asked by one judge on one side uh, may very well be either the majority or the minority view of, of this opinion, but they followed the questions and not necessarily their briefs or their planned oral argument. Every lawyer gives three oral arguments. The one they planned, the one they gave, and the one they wish they gave. And so you might as well come up there and be flexible and in a listening mode rather than a, a mode that says, I'm go simply going to tell you everything I had planned to tell you. When you get there, you might better be saying things that the judges want to hear because you need to think like a judge. 
So along those lines, uh, Justice Powell, um, when Appley gets up to give his or her oral argument, thinking like a judge, should he or she proceed with his or her own, ar own argument or respond to the points or the questions that were just made during appellant's argument? What do you think is the right course of action there? As I'm listening to my colleagues, and I, and, and I was anticipating that question, was that on a sheet? Uh, I think probably first respond to the issues that we're obviously having difficulty with based on the questions that we ask the appellant. Certainly leaving time to address the issues that they came in wanting to tell us about. But I think they're going to be able to tell, or if they're listening, they should be able to tell what's bothering the various justices, what positions they need to develop in order to bring a justice over to their side or bring them away from the other side. And so I think probably the most effective approach would be to answer the questions that are being asked even of the other side in the way that best reflects their case. Mm -hmm. Justice Mims, do you have a view on that? I think particularly when the appellee is, uh, is using their time. Uh, Justice Powell has hit, the, uh, has hit the nail on the head. The very first thing the appellee needs to do is to respond to the questions that, or the dialogue between the court and the appellant's counsel uh, because it's clear those are the issues that we're grappling with. And, uh, and you know, occasionally um, one of us will, uh, will just simply short circuit the appellee entirely by saying, you know, address this issue first. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, it really requires some dexterity to be a good appellee's attorney. So what's a, a mistake that an advocate often makes, or maybe a, an inexperienced advocate, a first-time advocate? The one that I always smile over is, uh, uh, two of them actually, one is when you don't recognize the friendly question. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, uh, Lee is right. Lee, will, Lee or Bernard will, will often say, uh, that was a friendly question, counsel. Uh, and, um, uh, and then second of all is uh, when we do ask a hypothetical and the attorney will object and say, but that's not my case. Well, we, we know that's mm -hmm. not your case. That's why we asked it as a hypothetical. But we have to look beyond your case. But. Um, we, there are some light moments during oral argument. Um, I, uh, I hope that we are not viewed as a hot bench, quote, in quote, because we really are trying to do the best we can. Uh, and we have a lot of respect for the attorneys who appear in front of us and uh, the, the occasional pro se um, appellant or appellee who appear in front of us. We, uh, we, we talk in terms of attorneys, but every now and then there will be a citizen who will come before us without counsel and will do a very good job. Uh, we all recall one young lady um, arguing a, uh, um, about in-state versus out-of-state tuition who referred to us as you guys instead of your honors and uh, we actually I think all smiled over it because she was not trying to be um, impolite or disrespectful that was uh, that was simply her lexicon mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a, it's an interesting process. It's a wide variety of uh, arguments I think. Uh, Chief Justice, are there, uh, is there advice you would give to the the new advocate or maybe even the experienced advocate? I think to all of them I agree with Justice Millett listen and be prepared. I don't care how eloquent you are um, nothing takes the place for being prepared. If you're prepared then you can bounce between issues. You can you know, uh, answer questions and go down the, a different path than perhaps the path that you had hoped you'd be able to follow in your argument. Um, it's an intimidating situation. So, you know, I would tell them, you know, take a deep breath and, and we're there not to trick you, but we're there to have a conversation with you and to better understand your case. This is your opportunity to talk to us about it. And so um, that would be my advice. But, but, but to listen and be prepared. So even the, the best prepared advocate will make the occasional mistake. So how does the court respond, Chief Justice, to those mistakes? So let me give you a, a hypothetical. Uh, 
an advocate, uh, there's a question about whether an issue has been properly preserved for appeal, let's say. Uh, and the advocate misstates whether it has or hasn't. In fact, the advocate says, Your Honor, I, I believe actually we did not properly preserve that for appeal, when in fact it had been. Would the court's inclination be to accept that concession, which of course would then eliminate an issue in the case, or to recognize that it was an error at argument and consider the issue? Well, you can't concede legal questions because we, we get to decide those. So only factual questions, perhaps, would we hold them to a, a factual concession. But if we recognize that they just were confused by what they were saying and made a mistake, because we've seen that, they, they, they misspoke what they meant, we don't hold them to that. We recognize that. Uh, and if it's a true concession, and if it's about an error preservation issue, I mean, we're going to go make up our own minds about that because that, you know, it's an interpretation of our rules given the facts of that case. Um, so I, I, we don't hold them to things that are pure mistakes, no. Or at least Lemons. I don't think we do. <laughs> Justice Lemons, do you, do you try to help counsel a little bit in that regard? Or? Oh, I think all of us try to help counsel. I, I, I hope I'm not wrong about this, but I, I think we're a very user-friendly court. And uh, I think there are concessions that are held against counsel that are made at the trial court and come up and are visible in the record. Um, but as far as making a mistake uh, in your oral argument before us, I think we're a pretty user-friendly place. And I would also say between the seven of us, typically somebody's going to say, did you really mean to say that? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to, somebody's going to mm -hmm. probably ask, and that's going to be one of those friendly questions. It's like, just want to make sure mm -hmm. you didn't mean to say that you really don't have an appeal, did you? <laughs> right. right. If they miss that, then they're yeah. really not paying attention. Exactly. Right? Exactly.